This week on The Destination Angler. We're basically looking for little pockets along either the middle of the river where there might be obstructions or boulders in the middle of the river. So anywhere where there's a pot. Some of these muskies, Steve, we catch, I get, they're at the front of their nose is wore down because they're sitting behind rocks in the middle of the river, nosing up on that, that rock drafting. There's no science in this, man. I mean, this is still the Wild West, this musky fly fishing thing. That was Brian Mays on the St. Croix River. Welcome to the Destination Angler Podcast, the podcast for anglers who travel. And I'm your host, Steve Haig. We go right to the source, the local guides and experts, to build your knowledge of top fishing locations around North America. It's a big world out there. Now go and fish it. I'm going away for a while, but I'll be back soon. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey anglers, welcome back to another episode of the Destination Angler, brought to you by Rocky Mountain Angling Club, offering uncrowded fly fishing in the Rocky Mountains since 1992, and by Trout Routes, the number one fishing app, helping you find new trout water so you spend less time on the road and more time doing what you love, trout fishing. And by Angler's Coffee, perfecting the coffee experience for the fly fishing community and anglers everywhere with small batch coffee delivered to your doorstep. It's darn near perfect. Hey, we've got some great shows coming your way, including one of the top tailwaters in the country, the San Juan River in northern New Mexico, and then the Provo River in Utah. Well, I'm super excited to announce that we have John McLean, son of Norman McLean. That's the guy who wrote The River Runs Through It on the show for episode 100, and he'll be talking about the Blackfoot River in Montana and the McLean family. And be sure to backcast to catch the last episode on the Indian Peaks Wilderness with Aaron Kreider. About an hour from Denver, the Indian Peaks Wilderness is a roadless area, crisscrossed by over 100 miles of trails on or near the Continental Divide with dozens of alpine lakes for the adventuresome angler. You won't want to miss these shows. And remember to hit that subscribe button to catch all the Destination Angler episodes coming your way. And if you like the show, please tell a buddy. Hey, special announcement for all you Colorado listeners. Come fish with me in Colorado on private water on Friday, September 15th. I'll be hosting a listener to join me on Terriol Creek, one of Rocky Mountain Angling Club's premier properties within an hour or two of Denver for a day of wade fishing. Visit my website to enter to win, and the winner will be announced on the August 24th episode. Can't wait. Today, our destination is the St. Croix River in northwest Wisconsin, and our guest is Brian Mays, owner of Amazing Outdoors, Prescott, Wisconsin. Hey, are muskies the fish of 10,000 casts? You be the judge. Brian loves to chase these apex predators on the fly, and the St. Croix River is his go-to fishery. The St. Croix is one of the original eight rivers protected by the Wild and Scenic River Act. With little or no development, the upper section offers a wild, remote, and unpressured experience for anglers. And Brian grew up in this area, had his first encounter at age nine with a 38-inch muskie on a Zebco Snoopy rod. After college, he did the corporate gig for a while until a big muskie ate his fly right next to his canoe. Inspired by the experience, he drove all the way to Montana, bought a drift boat, and the rest is history. And today, Brian covers the St. Croix from end to end and takes us into the mind of a muskie. Plus, we talk bird dogs and grouse hunting, top fly patterns and leader setups, and his philosophy on keeping it simple— Stick around to the end for a great presentation tip Brian calls walking the dog. Hey, all right, let's hear from Brian. Hey, Brian, welcome to the show. Steve, great talking with you, man. Yeah, for sure. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so how's life up in Northwest Wisconsin? You guys still got snow on the ground? I'm kidding. <laughs> well, <laughs> we had snow really late and it just disappeared and then went to summer immediately and you know, unfortunately, we're, we got a little rain the other day, finally, and there's a little bit in the forecast, I think, yet tonight, but uh, we're sitting at some low water again in certain areas. So yeah, sure man. Here. It's for like the third year in a row now. It's been kind of hot in the Midwest, you know, and right now we got all these fires in Canada and all these uh, air quality warnings, you know, blowing through the Midwest. So there's definitely been a haze in the air and right? some of it's been a haze I've never seen before in my lifetime. I know so. it. It's crazy. Bright Pretty sunny wild. days. It looks like it's cloudy out. So anyway, all right. So let's jump in. So here's my my first question for you is I got to ask you, are muskies the fish of 10,000 casts? What do you think? <laughs> well, 10,000, 1,000, 
sometimes it's three or four, you know, I, there's work involved in fishing for these, these critters. I mean, it, it, there's no doubt, but yeah. honestly, there's an element of luck that I, they choose you. And sometimes you get lucky. I've seen it happen where myself, I, you know, I've third, fourth cast of the day and bam, slam a 36 inch fish. I've had other customers come out and, you know, spend all day long and we never even see one. So, is that right? Um, wow. Yeah, there, there, there's some mysticism to the muskie, and I think that's why, not only you know a big toothy critter, but I think because people do end up trying for years sometimes to catch one of these fish, that tends to, uh, I don't know, add this mysticism to it, really? that, and, and allure uh, to it that that people love. But I had a guy out caught his first muskie, must have been about five years ago, and um, I think he'd been trying for three or four seasons. He said prior really? to really on a fly rod no this was conventional tackle, just conventional okay. yeah just conventional gear um now you want to add fly fishing to it man and and it's a whole i i hate to say it and guys <laughs> but it's like tying it's tying a hand behind your back a little bit it is you know fly fly fishing is obviously a little bit difficult for some people that have never done it even with a you know size 16 atoms fly in a trout stream that's pretty big uh with a like a four weight rod but you know we're using 10 12 weight rods wow 450 grain sinking tip line sometimes with uh you know as big as you know 10 12 inch flies so being able to control and cast that and then have you know the the strength and endurance to be able to handle that all day to be honest with you i i find very few of my customers at the end of the day who aren't sitting in the chair looking at at the river going where's the next spot because i'm not just going to cast it for nothing i'm going to take a break here <laughs> it wears them out right it's like casting a telephone pole it is i actually had it had uh that, so i have um, a clacker craft i run and then uh I'm, I'm so thankful for it the last few years because of the low water i have a little river rat pro series raft it's like 12 13 foot raft fits three guys it's not super comfortable for for three guys all day long but at the end of the day when you can get into spots that people can't because yeah. they have a drift boat or you know they're fishing out of a jet boat or something like that and it's just too shallow it fits the bill you know what let's get let's get back tell you what i want to ask you about the lure of musky fishing you mentioned it earlier so so what is the the big allure of musky fishing what is it that gets guys to want to chase and catch a musky for years on end sometimes before they actually get one well, I, again, I, I think it's the fact that they're large fish. Yeah. I think it's the fact that a lot of times those guys that do fish for a period, period of time, they'll have musky encounters. So these fish come in and they'll follow, maybe be lazy, just not interested in what the pattern is. But or they'll what see one suddenly. Is. But they'll see one or somebody in the boat will have one. And then, you know, it, it, it's it's kind of this secretive group of people kind of per se, you know, like buddies to buddies they might share some information but i doubt like most fishermen they share it all and with that i think it's just created this culture up here where you know you've got in wisconsin the whole louis spray cal johnson world record debacle on actually who holds the world record and is the is it legitimate and you know, there are all the stories that that come around that you've, you know, in Hayward area, which is a, a little bit e northeast of where I kind of home base. But, you know, you've got the Moccasin Bar and then you've got uh, the Treelands Resorts, which, which holds, you know, in the fall a, a, a fly only musky tournament for two days. But <clears throat> these folks, you know, they have the old they have the replica mounts in there. And it's just one of these things in Wisconsin with the up north culture. Musky, you know, is the state fish. And it just is everywhere you look. So you kind of have, even the walleye fishermen are, are forced to kind of look at these muskies all the time on the walls and everything else. And yeah, they're just, you, you just don't talk to too many people who at some point in their life haven't chased muskie yeah. up north. Yeah. How do they fight? You know, they, they fight pretty good. I, I tend to fish them in the river. So a lot of what I'm going to probably talk about today has, has that perception you know lens so a lot of guys that might fish muskies on the lake or even with some conventional gear some of this might not necessarily apply to them 
but uh, you know you've got the river current and then you know you're fit you're hooked in with a 40 pound or possibly 40 pound or bigger fish 40 inch 50 inch fish yeah it's amazing and, i mean it, they they don't fight as long as a lot of people would think yeah but they put up a hell of a run and then depending on what kind of scenario for current you're in you could be tangled up with that fish for a little bit okay i try not to tangle with them too long it's like get it in the net get it in the net <laughs> oh, for sure. yeah because you were telling me before the show that there's a pretty high mortality rate with even catching re- if you do a good job catch and release some of them still die is that right well, I am not a biologist and, and by all means, I, I don't work for any of the state fisheries, but I have interviewed some of the musky biologists in the state, talked to other wildlife managers, and the consensus is that there's a 10% hooking mortality for these fish. And that's wow. in nor- normal conditions. So on huh. you know years like this where I was out, I think it was... I think it was opening day of musky season. If not, for some reason, June 5th rings a bell. But beginning of June, 78, no, it was 77.8 degree water temp at 10 a.m. Oh, boy. And so at, at some point that the water becomes too warm and, you know, I, we've got to, I make the conscious decision to tell those customers either, you know, we're, we're fishing for smallmouth this, today and. It's happened a few times here in the last two years. Okay. Tends to usually happen towards the end of July or August where we start to hit that high 70 degree water temp. So, um, you know, a lot of times we'll go out and chase muskies right away first thing in the morning where we get some cooler water temps. And then as the water temp warms in the day, we'll, we'll, we'll start chasing some uh, small okay, I see. Gotcha. You got some options then. That's good. Yeah. There, there's lots of options, but uh, the hooking mortality, yeah, is, has been arguably studied and kind of put to bed for a lot of people and it's 10 percent. so one out of every 10 fish is probably going to die wow. and you can release that fish and probably never see that fish die swims away just fine yeah and people think ah oh, they're fine and one out of 10 might keel over that's yeah crazy. yeah it, it is too bad and that's you know there's a whole dynamic within the musky community that the whole catch and release thing and you know what do you do with it a fish that dies on you that's of legal size well i hope you don't float it down the river right i hope you take it home i mean if it's of legal size that by all means if you can legally keep it and it has died like go get it yeah but at the end of the day you know people get frowned upon for doing that and that oh, I'm i, sure. I, I kind of have to step back and you know go hey you know how many muskies did you catch last year and, you know one of them probably died you know, and, and I think we all got to look in the mirror before we start making comments on the internet about some things, but you know, the, the musky community is definitely a little bit on the harsh side, I think for people and uh, every, everybody's got their own opinion. I'm sure you get out West into some of the, the uh, smaller fisheries and it, it's kind of similar. So yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Well, let's talk about the St. Croix river. I mean, it's, it's a river that's well known, but I don't think that people know a lot about it, if that makes sense. I, you know, I think it's St. Croix, I think of the rod company, you know? (laughs) Exactly. And, and they're not even anywhere near actually the, 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 uh, park falls is closer to the Flambeau river. (laughs) Oh, is that right? Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Which is another great fantastic fishery, you know, but the St. Croix is very, I would call it unique. So I guess going from South to North, it confluences with the mississippi river down in prescott wisconsin and just kind of southeast or east of the twin cities and then it runs through hudson which you know a lot of people who travel back and forth between wisconsin use i-94 and so they're going over the st croix river there it's really wide they see a lot of motorboats once you get north of stillwater the river starts to narrow and become much shallower and then it goes through a portion called the dallas which is just it's it's the name for an area that is actually part of the exposed mid-continental rift so back in the you know back in the day (laughs) before all we were here uh there was glaciers and other things and there was a you know uh glacial lake lake duluth and through the melting of those glaciers and, and the draining of that lake it kind of carved out the St. Croix River Valley and that actually exposed some of the basalt rock 
from, I believe it's the Canadian Shield and that where the mid-continental rift, they actually pulled apart for a period of time about a billion years ago. So some of the rock that you actually see is kind of like source rock. And yeah, I, I've had many issues with my raft floor because it is sharp as glass. And oh, is that right? Wow. Yeah, you, you wouldn't think, think that, you know, this sand you just got out on, <laughs> but you don't feel it on your feet either. But the minute you apply pressure on something like a raft floor, yeah, Wow. It, starts, it starts leaking, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's one of the most beautiful rivers I've ever floated. And I truly believe it's underutilized the national park service, uh, I guess, going back into, you know, the, the desk or the, the kind of the lay of the land. Yeah. Once you get North of the Dallas and St. Croix falls, really development starts to drop off completely due to the national wild and scenic national river act yeah. uh, that was passed in like 1968 and then um you go through kind of a, a section that has a little bit of development but very little river is still fairly wide but it's it's very shallow so very little opportunity to get a motorboat in a lot of big boulders and you really got to know what you're doing or have a have a jet drive boat once you get north of highway 70 at that point now we're kind of in the heart of where this river is the border of Wisconsin and Minnesota. So that's one of the other unique things. I get a lot of customers who ask me, Hey, what fishing license do I need? Well, either a Minnesota or a Wisconsin license applies for a good stretch of this river. So it's kind of unique in that retrospect that people from each state don't have to buy another license and can fish. And the hell they can go around to the other side and put their boat in. It's still, it's a border water. So okay. uh, either state's license apply. So once you get north of Highway 70, the river starts to narrow. And there's a portion of that river between, I guess you could say, Grantsburg and Danbury, where the elevation change is kind of at its highest gradient. So the water picks up and there's a lot of big boulders. Uh, you've got a couple other tributaries that come in and confluence there. And then north of Danbury, you've got more confluences. The river narrows even more. And then the St. Croix actually is headwatered in a, a St. Croix flowage. But the National Park Service still keeps going up the Namakagan at that point. So then now you've got this whole stretch of the Namakagan River that runs all the way up towards Hayward that is all controlled by the National Park Service. And okay. what's what's great about it is, is the access is free. There's camping all the way up and down this river. So if you want to kayak down this river and do a day trip, great. You'll have plenty of access. You want to do a four day excursion from Hayward down to wherever you've got access and you've got plenty of camping options. That's cool. So there's, there's a lot of canoe outfitters. There's a fair amount of other guys that like myself that guide in certain spots in the river and, uh, it's just this amazing resource. And Steve, I'll be honest with you, I get out all the time. And I bet you more often than not, we don't see another soul on the river. And if we do, it's either one drift boat and they're either, you know, in passing. So right. we're not really fishing the same areas or we get a group of canoers to come down. I mean, okay. that's, it so or we might see a, wow. we might see somebody canoe camping you know on at, in a campsite on shore but very very rarely do i ever see many people on this river at all huh. in cer in certain areas now you can go closer to some of the bigger towns and you'll see people tubing on the weekends and uh other things and it, I, I i do say that i guess with a little bit of grain of salt i try to steer most of my customers to come fish with me during the week it's just, yeah, you don't have the weekend warriors and there are families that come out and enjoy the river on the weekend and as they should. So, you know, you get a little bit more peace and quiet during the week, but honestly, I've been out there on Saturdays and it's like, there's nobody out here. <laughs> I can't awesome. believe it, you know? And so I always like to talk about the St. Croix and I'm sure there's some other guides and some other people who might not um, appreciate how much information i give on the saint croix but i truly believe it is an underutilized resource and i would love to see more people fall in love with it 
because it's it's one of those places that's so close to the Twin Cities. It's so close to Duluth that it's a great place to just go hang out for the day. And I think people just drive by it heading up north all the time. That's why then. Hey, folks, I don't know about you, but it feels like the world of trout fishing is getting more and more crowded. But fly fishing shouldn't be a battle. Fight the fish and not the crowds and join the Rocky Mountain Angling Club. Members receive exclusive access to quality, unpressured catch and release fly fishing by way of arrangements with private property owners. You'll enjoy access to over 40 premier fly fishing properties in Colorado, Wyoming, and New Mexico. Every major watershed in Colorado is covered, plus 25 trophy producing ponds and lakes. I first fished with the Rocky Mountain Angling Club a few years ago and was super impressed with the quality of the fly fishing and the super helpful staff. These guys helped me plan my trip, explain which properties were fishing best. I even called the club for help with fly selection while standing knee deep in a trust stream. Let me tell you, these guys are true fly anglers. Join before September 30th and get a hundred bucks off your initiation fee. And they'll extend your membership through 2024. Just mention you heard about them on the Destination Angler podcast. So what are you waiting for? Gold medal fly fishing opportunities abound. Get on the stick and call the guys at the Rocky Mountain Angling Club and join today. Fight the fish, not the crowds. That's rmangling.com. Huge news, folks. The number one fishing app, and I'm talking trout routes here, has been updated to include the entire lower 48. That's 50,000 streams mapped and classified into four categories and 350,000 hand curated public access points marked and ready for you to explore. You know, there's nothing more exciting than finding that new trout stream or access point. I'm a huge fan of trout routes because they make it so easy. Say goodbye to stumbling around country roads looking for your next spot because Trout Routes provides every detail you need for each stream, including public and private bridges, stream flows, trail access, where to park, camping opportunities, boat ramps, and more. No service, no problem. You can save maps for offline use. With Trout Routes, I've found dozens of new streams and access points I never would have known about. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for Trout Routes today on your Apple or Android phone. So where are you doing your musky fishing? You're kind of describing all the way from Prescott on way, all the way up. Where do you think the good musky fishing is? Well, there's great musky fishing throughout the whole river. I'd argue kind of as you get closer towards the Mississippi, there's some big monsters down there. But I, I just don't think the numbers are what they are kind of as you get. There's an upper and lower portion of the river is kind of how it's described. So almost all of the lower portion is accessible via, you know, motorboat. Um, a lot of guys, you know, gear hawk down there all the time. There's absolutely great musky fishing opportunities from Prescott to, to St. Croix Falls. Myself, because I have a drift boat, because I like to, you know, kind of find that, uh, untamed <laughs> in, in wild places where I'm not seeing homes, where I'm not seeing cabins and I'm not seeing other guys. Yeah. Uh, I, I tend to go north. So I spend a lot of time between Grantsburg and Danbury is kind of where I do a lot of my guiding. Okay. Okay. And you need a boat up there or can you get in there and wade fish for these guys? You could, yeah. You could get in in certain areas and wade fish. You know, access, I guess, for wade fishing becomes relegated to where there's boat landings and stuff. And there's, okay. there, there is a hiking trail that runs along the river on the Wisconsin side. It's definitely, it's dense woods. It's the North woods. Oh, it is. Okay. You know, the, the national park service or the federal government owns a buffer zone. And I can't remember how much that is on each side. And then because of how unique the area is and with the landscape features, there's na state natural areas, there's state wildlife areas, there's uh, governor Knoll state forest, uh, there's county forest that buds up to this. So there's a lot of public land you could hike down in, but I wouldn't say you're good. You're not going to find a lot of trails that go down into areas in this, no, in this river system. So pretty so wild then. Okay. It's very, very wild. A lot of the spots that I fish, you know, you will float a couple miles of river without an access. Or without okay. a cabin. And how wide is the river in those sections that you're that you like to float in? It varies. Obviously, some of the the areas that, that have 
better current um, where they're neck down. You know, I've got a couple spots that are only 50 yards wide at one point around an island, you know, so maybe 200 yards wide total oh. if you conclude the land of. Okay, it's big. Yeah, it's not a stream. It's it's a good size river. But you can get in there and wade. It's shallow, you said, in a lot of places, huh? You can walk across it in a lot of places. No kidding. Oh, yeah. Huh. Especially this year, this year and the last few. Oh, wow. Interesting. Well, talk, let's talk a little about the history of this. Uh, you're talking about the geology. Um, I was reading that, uh, you know, French fur traders came through here. Probably, I think that's a French name, St. Croix. And then you had some Indians that were up in this area. What else can you tell us about the history of the area? Well, the St. Croix has been, you know, a, a travel corridor for humankind since, uh, I forget, you know, the Indians have been here in some form or fashion, I think going back to, you know, eight or 9,000, no, a few thousand years, I think is what they have. I can't, don't, this is where I'm, I'm, I'm not a historian either, Steve, but, um, so oh, come on. There, there's, <laughs> there's a rich history of the Indians using this waterway as a, as a highway yeah. to, and then obviously the, the, the fur trade, um, needed ways to get to and to and from the Northland and in the Minneapolis St. Paul area was a huge hub for that. Stillwater was, was, was a huge hub for that. So then, you know, we did a lot of logging at the turn of the 18th to 19th century up here. And so that's kind of what this river was used for was to transport a lot of that lumber out of the North woods down to the sawmills and still water. Yeah. And then 1914, I think is kind of when all the logging ended and, uh, then, you know, there's, there's a period of time where, you know, people built cabins and so forth on the river up and down. Um, there was individual families that had little ferry cars going across the river as, uh, we expanded kind of automotives and things like that. And prior to the, you know, interstate systems being put in. And then obviously in 19, I think it was October 2nd, 1968 national parks service was, was awarded the wild and scenic riverway act. Yeah. Right. And this was one of the eight original rivers and they took 200 okay. mile, <laughs> miles of river from, like I said, uh, all the way down in Prescott. So everything that is from Prescott and all the way up to St. Croix falls uh, it is still developed. There isn't kind of the deed restrictions that are north of that, but um, there's very limited development that can happen in on on that waterfront, on that riverfront, north of High Saint Croix Falls. I think at one point I, I was told it's um, the families that have cabins up there. They were only able to give them to the next generation, and then. Once that generation is done with it, the government's taking it over and knocking it down and oh, turning really? it back into wild. No yeah. No kidding. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So this, the stretch, most of the stretches that I fish, there is, I think there's only a handful of cabins in the whole stretch that I, that I actually no, do no most kidding. of my guiding on. Yeah. Yeah. That's super interesting. So the St. Croix was one of the first, I actually read it was the first river. It was, I think there was eight rivers initially eight that, in the yeah, first batch. That, Yep. Okay. And it was one of those. Yeah. And what now there's like 200 that are wild and scenic around the country, correct? I, I think so. Yeah. So there's 200 miles that are, uh, oh, 200 rivers with, I'm talking about 200 well, rivers I, are wild and scenic now. 200. I think there's a little more than that. Maybe Is there? Uh, okay. I think there's like 12,000 some miles of, of national scenic riverway. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, it's just one thing I, 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 I'm amazed every time I go down, I find something unique to kind of adore. You know, I, I was out the other day and I was just amazed at how many eagles are just hanging in the trees. We float right underneath them and then all of a sudden they don't like us there and they take off right above you, you know, six, seven foot wingspan. Wow. And I think. The other day when I was out, I counted seven, seven different eagles we saw oh, wow. in, in a six mile float. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Wow. Ospreys. Um, we were kicking deer off the bank as we were floating by for a small mouth the other day. It that's scared cool. the crap out of you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, I mean, they've done something right here with this and yeah. they preserved really its natural state. 
Hey anglers, you've heard me talking about Angler's Coffee for quite some time now, and I have a question for you. Have you tasted it yet? Well, if you have, then you know what I'm talking about. It's darn good coffee, isn't it? Hey, if you're like me, tasting's believing, and believe me, this coffee tastes great. My wife and I are hooked on it. Angler's Coffee offers an impressive spectrum of flavor profiles, so there's something for everyone. You know, when you're spending a day on the water, you need a great cup of coffee to carry you through, like the Coachman's Blend. Named after the famous Royal Coachman, you'll love the design of the bag as much as the coffee. This blend of medium and dark roasted coffee from Central and South America produces a flavorful and smooth cup with notes of chocolate and baking spices and a smooth finish. Order some today and save 10% with a custom subscription like I did. You pick the coffee blends you want, and they're delivered right to your doorstep. And if you're not 100% satisfied, they'll give you your money back, no questions asked. No kidding. A percentage of each sale goes to some great nonprofit organizations in the fly fishing community. So put a smile on your face, just like I did, and give it a cast. That's Angler's Coffee. Tastings Believing. What's the forest like up there? I mean, is it spruce and pine trees up that way, or do you still have deciduous trees? What's it look like? It's a mix. I'd say the Wisconsin side is more deciduous, and the Minnesota side, as you get to about that Highway 70 side, starts to become more conifer. Oh, really? Yeah, but it's surrounded by barrens on each side. So because with all the glacial till that ended up there, you know, on the east side, there's a ex lake bed or an old lake bed called Lake Grantsburg, and it's really dry there. And then you've got Crex Meadows, and then you go up into the Namakog, and you got Namakog and Barrens, and then there's Barrens on the St. Croix side with the St. Croix State Forest and St. Croix State Park. All of that kind of is a very unique landscape that um, runs kind of arid. So it's kind of, it's funny. It can, it can rain up there in the morning and drive by the ranger station and the fire sign could say low, come back on the way back that afternoon and say hi. And that's how, yeah, it's very sandy soil sand and and it drains really quickly, goes down into the groundwater. And then a lot of it seeps out into the St. Croix, the stretch that I'm talking about kind of halfway North of Taylor falls for about 40 miles there, there is thousands of springs that just creep in at you know 58 degrees you just see a trickle you get tributaries too yeah there's yeah there's the well i mean there's there's a lot of there's a lot of small tributaries you've got the apple river you've got the uh kettle river you got the trade river you've got the tamarack you've got the snake the wood the clam it is a big watershed and some of those are floatable rivers others are more on the trout stream side of things okay so you do have some trout in some of these tributaries huh some there's a couple that have i would call fishable trout and then there are other uh streams that have fingerling trout and are listed as a trout stream but i don't Not know really no okay pay, pay much time or <laughs> you know attention to it but yeah, some of these streams at 58 degrees. Oh, nice. and you go over to that, and there'll be just a little trickle coming out in the sand down down the bank. And you stick a thermometer in, and it's 58 degrees, and right out in the middle, That's you know, t- 10 feet away, will be it'll be 75 degrees. Wow. So you've got musky, but what else have you got in that river? I'm assuming you got pike and some other things, too. There, there's a fair size, sizable population of pike. Uh, there's decent walleye within the river. Huh. There's um, a, a lot of smallmouth bass, which is is a big quarry for all, for us up here. There's big channel cats and blue cats, and there is a population of stir, love, river sturgeon. Huh. There's also, which is really neat, a bunch of mollusks in the river. So there's clams and you will float over areas. So it'll just be a full clam bed of shells that have been cracked open from, you know, um, some kind of critter that's eating them. But it, it, it's very unique. I don't see that in a lot of other rivers, the, the density of, of the mussels, the clams. Wow. Okay. So it's kind of unique. Um, there's some endangered species within the river. I know there's a clam species that when they put in the dam down in Taylor's Falls, they knocked uh, the ability for the moon eye shad to 
continue their migration for spawning north. So there's a certain, I think it's a spotted, uh, I don't even want to tell you what, uh, people could go look it up on the St. Croix. They'll find it really quickly if they look for endangered clam species. But that particular clam species has a symbiotic relationship with the moon ice shad, and it cannot reproduce without that fish. Huh. So the the fish that are, or the, the clams that are still in that river north of the dam are, you know, something like 60 plus years old i can't remember the deer that oh, put really? the dam in there yeah because they're not gonna reproduce without yeah the fish. But, but they're still there which no is pretty kidding. wild yeah that is really interesting so once they're gone they're gone they well they're the dnrs on each sta state i think are trying to figure out something at this point but yeah it's just it's it, it was something that's been relatively newly discovered up there you, so, ever, you ever catch a catfish on a fly rod uh i've not caught a catfish on a fly rod but i've watched a 25 pound cat eat a double 10 cowgirl at the side of a boat in the figure eight. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> but you didn't get it in. What happened? Oh no, we caught it. Oh, you yeah. did. Just not oh, on yeah. the fly. Ride. Just, uh, no, no, it was, it was conventional gear. Yeah. Okay. So I, I do a mix of, of, of fly and conventional gear. I, yeah. There's a lot of fly fishermen out here, but I, I think the, the musky fly scene is still a little raw and untamed. So I get people that that want to want a musky fly fish, and they'll want to fish for half day, and then they want to throw gear for the other oh, they half because they get burned out. <laughs> well, their arms get tired. I'm pretty sure, right? A Twelve well, or eight, a, you know, telephone pole and a, you know half a chicken tight on the other end. Oh my gosh! I had a, I remember I, me and my buddy were out in Missoula. We were fishing rock. Where were we? We're on the Blackfoot, and there was a guy. We had this guide who we started at eight, and usually they're you know, wanting to be back at the shop by four or five. We didn't get back till eight o'clock at night. He kept going, well, we can keep fishing. We can keep fishing. And uh, man, it I, these were five weights, right? And at the end of a 12 hour day, you know, casting a five weight all day long, we're kind of like, can we go home? Uncle, you know? <laughs> so I'm that guide, by the way, you know. Yeah, are you? I, okay. I, oh, yeah. I'll yeah. be right I, over. I'll, I'll <laughs> fish till, I'll fish till you guys want to get off the river. As long as, you know, there isn't any circumstances that I need to get home for, which yeah. is, typically right. pretty rare <laughs> yeah, they're, they're hard guys like you are hard to find honestly i i you know I, I get guides quite often and they're hard to find i mean i understand they've got you know families and this is a job and you know they got a lot to do in the evening might have to tie up some flies clean your boat all that kind of stuff i get it but yeah that's that's what uh i, I don't know for me it's it's my season's so short i really truly have like a 90 if you want to chase muskies for me yeah i've got 90 days what is the season? Well, it goes, it, it starts here at the end of May. And it actually, I think it, it might not even go till the end of the year. But some river guys might might curse me for this. No. Uh -oh. I tend to shut down shop around September 1. One, because it gets cold. And not that I'm a freeze baby or anything like that, but there's just things you deal with at some point when you go fish and uh, try to offer a charter business for fishing for this. There's safety concerns. When the water temp gets to be a point that, you know, hypothermia it becomes an issue. And I've got to get you, if you fall out of the boat, I got to get you back into the boat and then four miles down river to get access to get you into somewhere warm. Or I got to build you a fire on the side, you know, there's oh, really? just, okay. I mean, the, the, that, that's a problem, you know, that's a safety concern. So as, as a, as a guy who has a lot of other hobbies in the year, it becomes pretty easy just to my core season on the river is in the summer. And the whole reason I started doing this is because the lakes get warm. And for me, I've always noticed a trend that the lake fishing seems to decline as the jet skis show up when the jet skis disappear the lake fishing gets better again how about that right well people screw things up <laughs> i don't think it's so much people th screw things up i think it's really truly water temp you know oh, you when, it's, okay. when, it, when it's really nice huh. to swim the fish go deep for deep cooler water yeah you know and not all fish but certain species do and like musky yeah some musky and they'll be they'll be sunning themselves in the weeds at some point but you know they they start to go deeper at certain times of the year what is the ideal temperature for a musky what do you like i like upper 60s 
Oh, you do. Now, okay. Again, that's that that's that's river fishing though, and the reason I like that is because when those lake temps, uh, top water temps starts to approach a high seventies, everybody shows up with their jet skis. It's summer. It's full. The fish go deep, and the river fish seem to all of a sudden turn on. Like that's when smallmouth fishing gets good. Right. Yeah. And what I've discovered through you know chasing muskies and smallmouth is that river muskies feed very heavily all summer long so that they can go through a pattern of of kind of shutting down in the winter and they have to fight current unlike a lake fish yeah so the pattern seems to be just a little different i run across a lot less fish in the fall when i've tried really hard and because of that and because of my dogs and because of my love for chasing rough grouse and woodcock and Ah. my ability to do guiding for that it's a lot easier for me to just say, Hey, I can't wear the shorts anymore and flip flops. And, uh, <laughs> it's time to put on the work boots and head for the woods with the dogs. So <laughs> what kind of dogs you got? I have, uh, some German short haired pointers. And oh, you do? I, okay. Yeah. I run, I run a couple setters and, and pointers as uh, English pointers as well. They're short hairs. They, they're pretty big rangy for grouse hunting, aren't they? I would say the, the short hair is probably not your quintessential grouse dog but i think that the short hair can be in a top grouse dog it just you know a setter is what most guys picture as a as a grouse dog yep and i think there's certain short hairs that are not very good grouse dogs and i think there's a certain stature to a to a short hair that lends itself better do you think a dog has to be like super smart to be a good grouse dog I, i feel like you know you watch a dog figure out how to hunt quail i used to do a lot of quail hunting and I had a dog that was eight years old. You put him down in a field that he's been to before and he knows exactly what to do, you know? Yep. And I feel like with a grouse or a grouse, man, those are tough, you know? There is a special dog, I think, that that excels. Yeah. And I've got very few of them. <laughs> uh, I've got some mediocre dogs, you know? I, right. And, and it's not that the mediocre dog can't hunt or can't pr- produce a, a an excellent hunt for for somebody, right? It's just when you get into dogs and you know a dog and find a dog that has it, it it'll you blow mean. you. It'll blow you away. It's so good, man. It's so funny. You get you got a and, dog that just finds a lot of birds. You yep. know, and and, and listen, yeah. and she's a horrible house dog, man. But I'll yeah, tell you, the best dog I've ever had in the woods and in the field. And 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 the other thing is, a lot of guys get worried about you know quail hunter, right? Come up from Kansas or something. Yeah, I'm um, getting in the north. What's how's my dog going to? you know, adapt to the cover. Not well, very good. Got, well, if you got a good dog, it, sh- it shouldn't matter. If you've got that dog that has the it, it won't take it that dog very really? long. Really? Oh, no. I, I used to take my dogs, my quail dogs, we do grouse in the early fall, like in October, when we say mm-hmm. grouse in Indiana. And, uh, but grouse hunting and quail hunting is so different. Like grouse hunting, you know, you don't want them getting out there too far. And quail hunting, man, I just let them go. I, yep. n- I did not slow them down. I let them go because they go running out they run the edge and all of a sudden they're way inside 20, 30, 40 yards inside of the woods. They're probably a covey of quail way back in there. And I've had that. I've learned the hard way, you know, don't get them yeah. out of there. Let them run. Yep. I've, uh, I, I let my dogs run in the grouse woods too. And oh, I, oh uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, I uh, expect them to adapt to the cover. And yeah, if they can't, if point. they can, if they can't adapt to that cover, they probably won't cut it here. Yeah, that's right, you won't be using them anymore, right? Well, it I'll find a good home with somebody who hunts a lot less than I do. Yeah, well, you make the mistake I did, and it's you know it's a family pet and a hunting dog, and then it turns out to be gun shy, and you've got a fourteen year old dog that hasn't hunted in thirteen years. You know, I had one of those. So, well, I've got an eight 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 year <laughs> eight year old short hair that uh, I made a lot of mistakes with. Really? And oh. yep. And I learned a lot of lessons and yeah. she's a good dog now, but oh, no kidding. every, every time she messes up, I know it's something I did, not her. Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> I know you're probably well, right. For the most part, for the most yeah, part. Yeah, no, you're right. It's a pretty general statement. Take me back, Brian. I want to hear about this, uh, this 38 inch muskie you caught on a Zebco Snoopy rod. What was good? What was the deal with that? How'd you do that? Well, I, as I, you kind of alluded to in the intro, you know, I, I, I grew up fishing walleyes and, kind of the the whole i guess that the whole purpose of fishing was to fish for table fare 
So yeah. we didn't, you know, I growing up, I, I didn't bass fish. I, I didn't really do much smallmouth fishing. Uh, we fished a lot of walleyes because I grew up very close to Lake Winnebago and it still is today a walleye factory, but we would make runs up North. And as a, as a child, my, my dad had a, uh, my grandfather actually, but you know, my dad had, had a cabin up, up near the Tomahawk area. And, you know, as you kind of grow up in that area in Eastern Wisconsin, Northeast Wisconsin there, everybody's got a cabin up North. So we would bounce around and go to different friends of his and stuff and cabins up North. And we were on three lakes. A friend of his had a cabin there. And I remember I, we were, <laughs> we were in a 14 foot Aluma craft with a Oh, seven and a half, nine horse tiller, something like that on the back spray painted in camel for duck hunting and still, you know, bench seats in it. And, uh, I went out with my, my dad and we knew there were muskies in the lake and he, for whatever reason, wanted to give that a shot for the day. And, you know, he, as a kid, he, he musky fished a little bit. And as when we'd go up North, we'd, we would try walleye fishing for a bit and then we would always kind of throw for muskies. And I think it was the ninth cast, nine years old. That's all I remember. Really? And, oh. Yeah. And, and I had a little Snoopy pole at that time. I think it was like three and it qualified probably for most guys as an ice fishing rod. <laughs> and I, I remember what? passing it up along shore into the cabbage, a uh, little maps number five and purple. And, uh, bam, Damn. I thought I got stuck. And all of a sudden it started moving. Wow. <laughs> and it, it was big enough and the boat, we, we did not have it anchored. So I, I remember the, all of a sudden that we were, the boat was moving with the rock that I thought it was on. And my dad kind of turned and he said, you got a fish on. And then <laughs> it jumped out of the water and really and it, chaos consumed. And can you still remember that jump? Like, can you see that in your mind's eye? Oh, yeah, I can kind of see it, but I've seen so many of them now that it, oh, okay. That there's, there's that one. And then the first time I saw a tarpon jump that kind of both collide for me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> similar because they jump kind of similar. Uh, yeah, tarpon's a little bit more aerobatic or, uh, uh yeah. acrobatic, but, uh, yeah, it, no, the, the, I remember watching him jump and kind of do the tail walk out and, it was a pretty special moment and you know i i don't share this very often and it's not something that i i particularly uh am, am too terribly proud of but it, it was the only muskie i ever kept in my life yeah. and yeah. uh and, and it was just again table fair thing for my old man yeah he's like keep it kill it yeah we ate it wow. we ate the damn thing how'd it taste it was fantastic Really? I still oh, remember shoot. how it tastes, man. Yeah, that's you that remember well, that. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It, it has a sweet taste to it in comparison to like a pike. Okay, but uh, you know, in in any regard, I, I you know, I I don't condone people. Uh, you know, yeah, you deplete the resource. Right, taking a bunch of these fish, they take a long time to grow, and catch and release is a big part of this whole culture. We we definitely As respect the fish, and like I said earlier, you know if somebody kills one and it's a legal size by all means take it home right. um you know if you want to mount a fish and you know you're going to honor it in some way and uh, go ahead so i'm not i will never never tell you you can't but at some point you know you shouldn't be taking multiple fish out of the system at, right. at, a, at, a, at a consistent rate and that's just that you know who you are if you're doing it and yeah. and you know and the rest of us knock it off <laughs> rest of us we just need to lead by example and leave everybody else alone because there's a lot of picture shaming and holding fish wrong and all this other crap and it's just you know yeah it's easy it's easy to be a keyboard warrior and tell other people how to live the lot live your life but it's really hard to go out and live your life the way you expect people to live their life when you're being a keyboard warrior because yeah. <laughs> we all make mistakes and uh it's so I call easy them haters to well it's just easy to criticize people man and it's hard for people to lift people up yeah. Yeah. Good point. So have you, have you taken other family members fishing since your dad took you? Oh yeah. I, I, my brother and I, uh, I have a, I have a 12 year age gap between me and my youngest brother. Oh. And because of that, one of the things that we've done year after year after year, probably for now, 
think we didn't do it last year for for reasons but i think if we had this would be like the ninth summer and i usually take four day you know four days off so work i used to work like a monday when i was doing the corporate gig and then we we load up and we'd go float the flambeau river for two days and go float the saint croix for two or three days nice. and my my brother still his has put the nicest musky in the boat at least in that excursion with him and i every year huh. he's very consistent but when you when you when you have a drift boat you know when i got into this whole thing steve and a little story for you here if you don't mind going down the rabbit hole let's do it so i kind of told you this as, as we were talking earlier about myself i i started out fly fishing with for trout and then family moved down to florida and i got kind of ruined down there with an experience of seeing my backing for the first time on a snook on the beach and i came back and i just was struggling to go fly fishing for trout it just didn't do it for me yeah. and a friend of mine said well let's go out and chase some smallmouth on the fly and i'll show you maybe we can get a musky and i looked at him crazy like musky on the fly hey what's this yeah and i started digging around on the internet and there's this whole like underground culture of musky fly fishermen that are like the rebels and black sheep of the fly fishing industry and i'm like holy cow i think it might fit in with these guys yeah that's <laughs> me <laughs> that's me <laughs> and so he we went up north on flambeau river for, he, he paddled his canoe and i fly casted and i had a musky come up and and eat the fly and like stop in the water right next to the side of the boat with the fly in it and I'm looking like eye to eye with this musky, I don't know, this 30, 35 inch musky. And it dawned on me at that second that it was actually a musky and it actually ate my fly. And I went to set the hook like a trout set and it yeah. pulled the fly right out of the musky's mouth and he just swam away out of my life. Really? Oh my God. But, but at, at that point, I, I, I was like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. Like I have yeah. to do this all that the time. That was cool. Yeah. And, and the whole you know, the Flambeau River is really unique as well. It's kind of run by the state and kind of has a similar setup to the St. Croix. And so I, I was just blown away. And then I found the St. Croix, which was right in my backyard. I, I That summer, I spent countless hours scouring the internet. Of, Am I going to drive out to freaking Montana and buy a drift boat? Uh, because I'm not doing this in a canoe because I was worried already about dumping tackle in the river and I, I right. knew I knew what a drift boat was. I had seen guys with drift boats before on the river, and I said, yeah, that's the way to do it, not this canoe crap. So I ended up finding a kid who had uh, a boat from Montana. I think it's a Don Hall boat that's older than me, a wooden boat. Wow. It's got to be almost 40 years old now. And he was selling for like 1500 bucks with the trailer. So I bought it. It was viking flipping purple purple and i grew up real close to lambeau <laughs> field and that was like sacrilegious so yeah you gotta change I spent the color <laughs> countless hours sanding and redoing this whole wooden boat and, and then i came to the realization the first time i went out with a friend of mine i wasn't going to be doing a whole lot of musky fly fishing because i had to row the boat yeah right nobody else was going to row my boat for me to fish and that's when things started to change for me. <laughs> that's when I started really living a little bit more vicariously through other people and really had found a passion for giving other people experiences that they didn't have before. Yeah, that's cool. And, and I had a lot of friends of mine who had never caught a muskie. We went out and got the first muskies. And that's just kind of what really spawned the whole desire to, to want a guide. How hard is it being a guide up there when your season's so short? It's tough. Financially, it's very tough. Uh, yeah. This year is uh, is tough. Uh, I tried to raise my rates, and in hindsight, probably not the best time to do it. But at the same time, you got to pay the bills. And, that, and that's part of the reason why I, I, I do the rough grouse and woodcock thing. And okay. honestly, I, I work side jobs. I, I've got a couple of friends of mine that own construction companies, and do uh when i'm not guiding i'm usually pounding a hammer or finishing off concrete <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it's just what it takes to kind of keep the, the dream alive you know if i was booked every single day of the summer for 90 days maybe i could do it 
full time and carve enough of a living out of it, but it's so short and yeah. you know, it's three months out of the year. I, I can't make enough money in three months out of the year to pay yeah. the bills year round. Right. Well, uh, thank you for doing what you're doing. I mean, I, I'm sure glad you're up there and willing to take people musky fishing with a fly rod. That's pretty cool. It's a true passion, man. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't do it because of the money. Um, I do it because of the desire to live differently. Yeah. And, um, I'm somewhat of a Christian man. I try to be better every day, Good for but, you. but, uh, somebody told me a long time ago that you can't serve two masters and money, um, money definitely becomes a master in a lot of people's lives. And it was for me for a long time and it makes the world go around, but at the same time, you can't buy happiness. Yeah, exactly. And because you had a corporate job before this. Yeah, for 17 years was uh sales running around, making six figure income and uh missed a lot of things in life that uh I took for granted and uh don't want to take those things for granted anymore. And that was part of the switch. No kidding. Wow. And tell us about your podcast. Yeah, so I I, I got a podcast. Um it, it really kind of highlights uh some of the things that I enjoy in the outdoor space. A lot of bird hunting topics just because of the friend network that I do have. And I don't know, fishermen are always harder to talk to for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, you know, the, the, uh, this time of year, man, you try to get a guide on the phone like me, you know, it, it, it's, it's a difficult they're thing. I, yeah, they're busy. I, I, I had to block this day off and then fill it with a bunch of other stuff that I knew I had to get done. <laughs> oh, did you? Okay, well, thank you. I well, appreciate you. It's all right, man. I, the sun is very powerful. And after a few days in the sun, it, it doesn't hurt to have a day off. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So your podcast, you do a lot of hunting. Yep. A lot of, a lot of bird hunting, rough grouse, uh, quail hunting. Okay. Uh, I, I actually, this off season went down to Arizona and chased, uh, three different kinds of quail. So we covered a little bit of that, but you know, the roots are, you know, fishing, musky fishing, some fly fishing, some fly fishing for smallmouth. And, uh, and then we cover a lot, I kind of like to cover a lot of the conservation issues and then also like the groups of smaller, you know, there's the pheasants forever, the trout's unlimited, the, the big 800 pound gorillas in the conservation space, but people don't really know who like the Minnesota sharp tail grouse society or like the Wisconsin sharp tail grouse society is, you don't know, like a lot of the hard work that they put in for dying out population of game birds, native native game birds and uh yeah so i like to cover stuff like that you know oh, and good for you get on some of the biologists in the area and talk about the fisheries and the health of things and some of the things that hey just a smattering of different outdoor topics whoever i can actually wrangle to sit down and talk to me all right there you, go. <laughs> you gotta wrangle them so what's the name of the podcast it's called the amazing outdoors podcast okay you can right, find it on all the the podcast players and stuff like that all right well, let's shift gears back to uh, to musky because I'd love for you to tell people about you know the species. You know, tell us about musky, like from an angling standpoint. Well, they are a fish that will surprise you and turn you around, backhand you, and leave you scratching your head every time you you get off <laughs> the water. There is really even the good guides and people that spend every day in the water. There's a pattern to the fish fish tend to hold in certain spots that they like but that doesn't mean that that fish is going to eat or even show its face and the small window that we you know drift by <laughs> yeah right. it, it's got you know it, it maybe eats once a day twice a day a few few small items a day might chase some things but like you know we're going to go by in five minutes and fish this spot might fish a spot for 15 20 you know, the likelihood of that fish to be able to be showing up and eating. Again, I said earlier, there's an element of luck to this, but. Yeah, it's called fishing. Yeah. So where we kind of start hedging that luck is kind of what I like to, to look at, or kind of how I like to look at it. These fish like to hang out in areas in the river where they can ambush prey. So if somebody likes to chase big chunky trout with a streamer, you can literally duplicate your efforts exactly the same as you would for a big chunky trout in huh. the river. These fish are going to be behind big rocks, boulders in the middle of the river. They're going to be in slack water eddies. They're going to be up along timber. And 
again, the, the, the river is constantly moving. So this, this is a big fish, right? Right. Smaller fish, but like you're, you're, everybody's after that 35, 50 inch, somewhere in that window. That's the muskie that they want. Well, that, that fish has been in the river for, for a decade or more. And it's had to learn to live differently than a lot of fish that live on the lake. You know, big fat mama on Lake uh, or on Bay of Green Bay, just lay there in the sand and wait for something to come by. Yeah. It doesn't have to expend a lot of energy to consume or to, to, to do anything in life. Well, the fish in the river has to expend a lot of energy just to exist. And so I find that the fish in the river, and this is another reason why I prefer chasing muskie in the river over the lake, is muskie are more opportunistic in the mm. river. You put something close to them, they're going to come out and investigate if they're if they're in that that mode of I'm hungry. And you know, I there's there's a lot of hoopla in the fly uh, industry, and when we've got a six month winter up here. Uh, a lot of the guys up here spend six months out of the year tying crap on their vice that, that, you know, looks pretty to them. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you got to be able to fish it all day long. And okay. what, what do you that, mean by that, that? Like, don't go so big. Is that what you mean? Or, well, I, I think it's really easy to go by and that, that fly looks really good, but that's your opinion. I, we don't know the fish's opinion. And <laughs> I'm a firm believer of that. You do not have to throw big flies. I catch more small mouth or more musky every year on small mouth gear accidentally than we do fishing for muskies. Huh. Okay. So yeah, I mean, and, and that's, that's with gear chuckers and fly anglers combined. What's muskies, you know, what are the, their favorite food sources? Well, it, it varies within different systems. So we've, I guess, a little bit of history on, on muskie in and of itself. Muskie is native to our river systems. Back in, in settlement, we dammed up, a, uh, you know, like the Chippewa Flowage, which is a really, you know, de big destination in Wisconsin for muskie fishing. We, da we dammed that, la that, that up. That was a river. Yeah. And so now that muskie sink got involved and people realize that there's this lure behind muskies in the you know, last number of decades. We've now transported these muskies all over into lakes and different places. So to really kind of answer that question, we got to kind of dial into it. You know, what is the, the forage base more specifically in like the St. Croix river, because you could go out on the, the, some of these lakes where they have like Cisco or Tulabi and you know, at a certain time of the year, that's what they key in on. You know, there's a big mayfly hatch on Lake Mille Lacs and the tulabies are up on top going nuts. Well, you better be out in the middle of the lake fishing around those tulabie schools because you're going to catch a big fish doing that. Now, on the river, we don't have that kind of fish. There's some shad in certain areas of the river, but I would say the primary diet for, for these fish are mostly other small forage in the river. So small, small mouth small pike, small walleyes, but the biggest density of fish that I, I, I think that the St. Croix muskie feed on is red horse. Red horse. And other, yeah, red horse suckers and other sucker species in the river. Huh. That, is, that is definitely the largest of the forage base in that, in that river. So huh. I like, I like to fish with flies that are on the small side of like what's small like how many inches uh i fish with stuff that's anywhere from four to eight inches okay. if it's bigger bigger than that there's times of the year where it's it's worth it there's spots that are worth it but at the end of the day you're expending a lot of energy to throw this big fly to make yourself happy because they, they make those gigantic like foot long plugs yep. for spinning rods right yep yep and everything i do from conventional to fly fishing on the river i always gear it down huh everything that you find out there in the musky world from the gear chucking side is all really based on lake fishing so that's why the beauty of fly fishing is you can just go to the vice and create something so a lot of my the flies that i use are patterns either that i've timed myself or i've got a couple couple fly shops up here shout out to mend and 
Thorn Brothers, the Fly Angler, Musky Fool in Wisconsin's another good one. They sell some custom tied stuff, and there's good can I guess production musky flies out there, but yeah. um, the the fancy stuff you know is is tied at bars in January at the Wednesday tying, yeah. event, you know, and is that right? And, uh, and I, you know, guys get carried away, give a couple beers, and they just Might keep throwing fun. freaking deer hair on there, man. Yeah. And, and you add a couple links of articulation. Now we got some game changer T bone thing. And, you know, again, more power to you if you want to fish it. And I'm sure you can catch fish on it. These fish will eat just about anything that you put in front of their face. <laughs> what are your favorite patterns without giving away maybe your secret patterns, but do you have a few you could toss out there for us? So I like a, a, a single hook. Buford. Okay. And big credit to Brad Bowen, who was kind of the godfather of that pattern. But it's just a it's a it's a couple any color hackle feathers, long, some tinsel, any kind of filler you want in there from a aesthetic tail look. And then it's deer tail and deer hair. And you spin up kind of a round head front. So it kind of moves water, does that walk to the dog look. And, um, that to me is the quintessential musky fly. I tie them in from a one knot up to seven knot hooks. What colors? My favorite color is pink and white. Pink and white. Okay. Pink's not just for girls. That's the fly I tie ah, myself. For musky. Uh, yep. Yep. <laughs> Could you, uh, would you mind shooting me a picture of one of those guys and I can throw that out on my Instagram page? I can. I definitely will. Nice of you. Thank you. All right. So Buford style. What else? So, and then I also tie up myself. I tie up some, some deceivers. I guess it would be kind of a deceiver style, but again, it's, it's a feather tail, some tinselly color stuff. And then instead of tying that big bushy Buford head, I just tied, you know, deer hair on there and push it back. And, and, okay. uh, it just creates that kind of cone conical head. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's guys tying game changers and other things out there. I really look at efficiency. If I'm going to sit down and tie something at the vice, I want to be able to bang 10 flies out in an hour and a half instead of yeah. bang one fly out. Yeah. A guide tie. It is. It is. And it catches fish. Right. Yeah. You got to keep it simple. I mean, if you got to tie a bunch of flies every night, man. And then people, you know, as a, as a guide, this is, this is one of the things that, that I don't know that. A lot of people perceive and i think maybe maybe not all guides look at it this way but when i have a client and i've got conditions right i've got cards i'm dealt every day right so i've got a client whose acumen might not be the same as mine maybe this is one of very few times that this person goes out and fishes this over the over the course of the year mm -hmm. and they're spending a good bit of coin with me to come do it and so i have to match up his ability and skill set with what the pattern on the river is and the tactic that is going to suit his skill set to be effective and fish all day. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. No kidding. So when I throw, when I got a guy that's 55 years old in the boat who isn't an expert fly caster and owns a five weight at home, I can't put a 12 inch fly on his rod. He's going to cast it for 45 minutes and look at me like I'm flipping crazy. Okay, you want me to do this for another eight hours today? Um, so that's kind of where this whole smaller fly, I guess, mantra that I have kind of roots with, if, if you can cast a 12 inch fly and that's what you want to do up oh, hell, I got them. I'll throw them on for you. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I want you to have the line in the water. I want you to be fishing effectively. I want you to be casting accurately. And the minute that I see something that's not quite right. I'm going to look to downsize even further because that's going to help you place the fly. Okay. It's more important. The fly placement's more important than it is the fly size. Oh, interesting. How do you fish for these guys? What are the main tactics? So we're kind of slowing up in the river often. When these fish are feeding, they'll be in current. When they're kind of in that I'm interested mode, but maybe I just fed or I'm maybe going to be moving into feeding soon. They'll be typically in still water. Okay. And then, and then when they're not, or I guess not, they'll be right on the edge of current. 
And then when they're not feeding, they'll be in still water completely just hanging out. So on a river, you'll have, well, like a typical like trout stream, even that TU has done, you kind of have the, the pool run or pool riffle run pool kind of yeah. set up. Right. So these, these muskies during any course of that feeding cycle will be in the riffle or they'll be in the run or they'll be in the pool. So you have to kind of fish it all because you, you don't know where they are every so you're time not you're sight out. fishing you, you, to them. Sometimes you can, oh, if yeah. you have a really good eye, you know, and the water level's low, like we're starting to get to, I, I was casting when I was out for a evening fish myself after uh, guiding a couple guys, uh, two days ago and, uh, fish till dark and went out for a couple hours after they, they wanted to go in. And I had a giant musky just, I, I, I was floating down the rivers at catching smallmouth. And all of a sudden I saw that tail move and I'd bumped, I had bumped that fish and there was too much of a glare to see him. Now, had I seen him, I would have dumped that, that seven weight in a heartbeat and grabbed that 10 weight. Uh-huh. But I ended up kind of circling around. I rode back up river and I came back, floated it again with the 10 weight, didn't move him. So you can't always see these fish. A lot of times where we were using, you know, heavier sinking tip line, we're getting that fly down six, seven feet into deeper holes. They like those deeper so, holes when they're feeding then? No, they, they like the deeper holes when they're kind of just being lazy. Okay. So typically what we'll do is in current, I'll slow the boat up so that the angler can fish at a 45 in front of the boat. It's imperative and important for both the line. So you're not, if musky comes up and hits, you got a big bow in your line and he comes up and hits your fly, you go to a strip set, you're strip setting to nothing. So you got to have tight line. And in order to do that, you got to be fishing in front of the boat and using that current to your advantage. So we're basically looking for little pockets along either the middle of the river where there might be obstructions or boulders in the middle of the river. So anywhere where there's a pot, some of these musky Steve, we catch, I get their the front of their nose is wore down because they're oh, really? sitting behind rocks in the middle of the river, huh. nosing up on that, that rock drafting. So sometimes they're in the middle of the river. So typically I've got an angler that's fishing mid river structure. And then I've got another angler who's fishing shoreline structure. And that could be anything from a quick drop off again, from this volcanic basalt rock that's been carved out. So it'll come down. There might be a shelf of 10 yard wide shelf of six inch deep water. And then just like that, it'll drop to eight feet. So we might be pulling flies off that shelf, you know, or there could be a log jam and a back eddy and we'll swing around through that current and come back, throw some flies up at that log jam. There's a lot of different places that these fish hang out, but they like timber and they like rock and they like anything that they can draft behind. Huh. So if you kind of look at it from that lens, when you go out on the river, you'll find that these fish can be anywhere, anywhere. I've seen them on sandbars in the middle of a sand flat just sunning themselves you're never going to i mean it's tough to get that fish to eat by the time you see him probably not going to get them to eat but they can be anywhere but more than likely where you want to get that feeding fish is right off in that predator eddy in your your typical current coming around big boulder sitting there and there's a big eddy behind there and okay same spot guy would want to look for smallmouth you know but some some of the time that small mouth's not there because there's a big predator there. <laughs> right. Just, if you if you are seeing if if there's a big musky in a hole, are there any small mouth in that hole or they've all oh, located? Yeah. Oh really? Okay. Oh yeah. They they get along a lot better than you would think in the river. Huh. I'd be nervous if I was a small mouth. I would be nervous too. <laughs> right. Because at any moment it's his his time could come. Yeah, right. <laughs> are muskies super explosive, like zero to 25 miles an hour in their body length type thing? Yes. Yeah, they are. They can be, you know, other times they can be super lazy in their approach to how they come in and, and want to eat. You know, I've had them follow 
so like top water baits where you could see the two eyes coming behind the top water really? bait, oh. and they never eat. And then I've had other times, like one time I was out with my uncle and he's a ex commercial fisherman from Florida and he's set in his ways and he doesn't fly fish, but he brought up his uh, big ugly stick. He's caught plenty of red fishing on the inlet down there and that with his mono line. And I said, it's not going to cut it, Joe. And he didn't listen. And yeah. he threw top, top water all day long. He had 11 strikes on muskies, no fish in the net. We had four out of those 11 were full, full projectile or uh, they full came out. I mean, just came out of the water, just oh, straight wow. up three feet up. Really? Hammered this for T-bone, this freaking top water bait. And he goes set the hook and nothing. Well, what happened? Well, he's using mono line. So you mean he broke him off or what? Stretching the line. Oh, not it just couldn't get them to stick what kind of line do you need i use braid i use okay. 80 pound braid if i'm using conventional that doesn't stretch as much it doesn't stretch at all and then you know with with uh you know my i guess if we could cover uh kind of what setup i use for for musky fishing for flying for yeah flying let's do that hunters. yeah so a lot of guys i mean you rio makes a product i think that's kind of their predator pike series combination of a pre-made leader with a tippet of bite wire in it typically they come in like six or seven and a half foot lengths i think they're horrible <laughs> so really. yeah but nothing against rio if they're a sponsor of your podcast I they're not you, sorry um <laughs> their smallmouth bass line sucks too by the way but <laughs> at, the, at the end of the day i wouldn't recommend it don't buy the cheap rio smallmouth bass line by the scientific angler line is much better. It, it, it's much better. I, it just performs way better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's just my opinion. I spent a lot of money on lines over the last few years trying to find the right mix and was very disappointed with that one. But I really truly think that if you've already, as an angler, invested in the rod and some flies and you want to go chase muskies, you are 100% off, better off tying your own leaders. Really? Huh. Yep. Okay. Just straight up perfection loop, get a mono, high diameter mono. I use like a 50 pound section. So I perfection loop about a three foot, 50 pound section. And then I tie in, you know, a wire bite tippet or 80 pound floral. Okay. And I typically, my leader setups are anywhere from four to five feet. That's it. Oh, that's it. Really? You got to have shorter leader to turn over a big fly. Yeah. Uh, okay. And and are are musky, you know, line shy? Are they leader shy at all? No, I, I don't think so. Huh. Okay. I have not noticed a significant difference in using fluorocarbon, steel, my actual like a, <laughs> a metallic steel color wire, or a darker colored coated wire. I haven't seen a fish turn away that I would 100% say that was because of the the leader. No, it's, I'm sure there's guys out there that are willing to argue it, but I, I I like to keep things simple. And, and that's, I think it's very easy in this fly fishing space to get complicated unnecessarily very quickly. What kind of retrieves are you using? So we'll use a combination of single and double handed retrieves. If the angler's comfortable doing a double handed retrieve and knows how to cast a fair distance, I like the double hand retrieve. It just allows you to move the fly faster. What is that exactly? Tell people about that. Cause I don't think trout fishermen are doing double. Handed <laughs> retrieves. So basically what we're, you know, I, I tuck the fly rod underneath my, my right in my right armpit yeah okay and then i use both hands to strip the line in boom 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 really fast yep and sometimes it's short strips i'll do a combination of strip strip pull uh you know sweep maybe sometimes you know fish don't like it fast i it's more rare for that to be the case but um so sometimes you know and a lot of times my a lot of anglers just aren't comfortable doing they're not used to it's a salt water in me <laughs> huh. I, I was very easy you know stripping little little uh 
schminnels on on the beach catching snook and then sight casting the big snook doing all this stuff yeah yeah and the little twitches cool. you know is kind of where i found it to really make some of those buford flies uh do that nice walk the dog and then it a couple real nice twitches and then maybe a a long one foot strip gets that fly to kind of wiggle and then turn out and kind of float back up or if you're using heavier line maybe sink back down a little and uh and th- i really like to get that up and down motion of a fly so that's where kind of you can tie things a little bit heavier on the deer hair and use a little heavier line or vice versa there's there's no science in this man i mean this is still the wild west this must yeah. be fly fishing thing and uh so there's there's always stuff i learn every time i tie a fly up and i throw it on one rod and fish it with that line or i fish it with a different line or you know That's fishing awesome. trying to get howitzer heads to fit on some kind of you know game changer style top water you know there, there's always something to experiment with <laughs> yeah right right let me ask you this Brian, what is your number one tip for a muskie, a fly fishing muskie fisherman? Didn't say that very well, but you know what I mean? So number, number one tip, um, how do we kind of condense this down? Yeah. I, it, it's been a trend. I mean, if, if people couldn't tell where this was probably going, but it's don't be afraid to downsize it. Don't upsize uh, right away. Don't, don't go, don't, don't go, go from. Way. Yeah. Don't try going down. And if you're still not moving fish, then, you know, you got to throw the, the, what do you got in your fly box at them? But don't discount that. It, it's like, you know, all, the, all these tackle companies out here, they're all in business to sell you something. Right. Right. If the fisherman hasn't figured out that we're one of the most marketed to groups of people in the world with a bunch <laughs> of yes, then you're a little ignorant, but that's okay. Uh, um, yeah. But at the end of the day, I still think one of the best musky baits in the world from a conventional fishing standpoint is a MEPS number five or a MEPS musky killer. And that is just a simple deer hair on a, on a treble hook with some beads and a spinner. And I guess that's kind of my point is, is number one, keep it simple and, 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 and don't be afraid to throw, you know, a, a six or a four inch fly for these fish especially okay. especially if you're out fishing and you think that you're not hitting the spot if you're not hitting the spot downsize make find something that's easier to cast your percentage of connection or seeing fish is going to go up exponentially if you are fishing the 10 percent of the river that's holding fish there you go and part of the reason I, I see people that have success versus not have success is because of that factor. Yeah. If you okay. cast five feet away from that log, maybe 10% of the time that fish is going to come out. But if you cast on that log and don't get stuck, I mean, I'd be 90% of bit. that. Yeah. And I, another thing too, I tell my customers, muskies choose you. And if you're not getting hung up, you're not catching fish. Huh. Period. Cast into the cover a little bit, huh? Cast into the cover. Hell, smallmouth coming up here in July and August. I tell a lot of customers in certain spots, cast it in the grass on the bank. And pull it in. Gently pull it in, just like a frog would be jumping off yeah. the bank. You're, you're, you're casting a Dahlberg diver de- deer hair frog pattern. Let's just, you know, put some common sense behind this. Keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, my gosh. Well, Brian, we are running out of time here. It's been great having you on, man. Thanks for being on the show. I appreciate it, Steve. It was it was great to connect. Yeah, for sure. I, I got just one more kind of life question for you. And I, I'm kind of curious, somebody who's been doing this for a long time, like what is hunting and fishing given you? Everything in life. <laughs> really? I would probably be in not very good places in life if i didn't have hunting and fishing i have a pretty addictive personality and uh hunting and fishing were that fix for me that kept me out of trouble kept me out of going to the bars kept me you know through my 20s trying to seek for something more yeah huh no kidding 
You know, there's a lot of people I talk to who say the same thing, you know, that this fishing, fly fishing is, you know, has saved them. You know, a lot of folks are like that. Yeah, I, I, there's, there's something to be said about uh, enjoying what the creator created for you. There you and, go. And, and, and I don't mean to, you know, end on that note, but at the same time, there's a lot of beauty out there. And a lot of people are stuck at home on their screen or on a television. I mean, think about kids and the way they grow up today. And uh, I, I was one of the lucky last bastions of not having a game console in my right. house. And I truly believe that if I did, it, my life would be different. And I'm so thankful for the way I grew up yeah. and the values of the outdoors that my family had. Uh, we had to get outside. You had to yep. get outside and make up your own fun. All right, last question. Your favorite place for the hungry, thirsty angler at the end of the day? Well, I can't offer you a beer or a, a burger place because, you know, we're I'm a Wisconsin boy, true and true. And yeah. you wouldn't be able to go up to Grantsburg and fish for muskies without a stop at the Brunette Dairy Cooperative for some soft serve ice cream and some cheese and other little they, they got a little deli in there. Cheese curds? I think, oh yeah, you can get fresh cheese curds there. Love the ones those. that make this oh. week. Oh yeah. But they are well known for their, for their, uh, their soft serve ice cream and it's fresh. I mean, it's fresh ice cream. Oh, no kidding. What town's it in? It's just east of Grantsburg, Wisconsin. So Grantsburg. it's Brunette County Cooperative, I think is, is, or Brunette Dairy Cooperative. There you go. Okay, folks, there you go. Brian, how can people get in touch with you if they want to talk about a trip or just find out what the fishing's like up there? Well, I would highly recommend either giving me a call directly and you can find out all my contact information at uh, amazing.com, A-M-A-A-Z-E-N.com. Uh, I do have some published rates out there uh, for booking online for hunting and fishing. Uh, I can give you a better deal if you contact me directly uh, you via email, phone. Uh, through Instagram is kind of more active, but yeah, you can find some rates out there, but uh, yeah, if you want to come hunt or fish with me, uh, call me direct. I can cut you the, the booking service fee. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sounds like you need to give Brian a call if you want to go folks. So Brian, I wish you extraordinary success and all your adventures to follow. And folks, thank you again for listening to another episode of the destination angler podcast. We will post bunch of these great pictures that brian sent me uh, a couple pictures of his fly patterns and whatnot on the destination angler website and on my instagram and facebook pages and uh, as always you can dm me or email me with comments and suggestions at shake50 at gmail.com hey, if you like the show please share it with a buddy as always our music is by brothers fountain hope you joined the show and we will see you again soon tight lines everybody well i'll go i'll go i'll go i'll go from the land to the shining sea, but I know, I know, I know, I know, there's more to life than what the eye can see.